I am here today with Carol Eschweiler. Carol, I understand that you got into computers at a very early age. Well, I, I did. I was always very fascinated with math, logic, things like that. And somehow, when I was nine years old, back in 1960, I got a toy, and it was called the Thinkatron, and it was a very primitive uh, pseudo-computer device that had many hollerith, many IBM cards that had simple questions like the capital of the United States is Pennsylvania, <laughs> Washington, D.C., or Timbuktu. And then you'd put the card in, and you'd turn the crank, and the lights and go blink, 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 and it would magically say, it's B, so you know Washington, D.C., and I was fascinated by that. Of course, what I had to do then was to take all the cards and back engineer where the punches were so that I could cut up cereal boxes and make my own questions, like which brother's the do goofiest or, or, or yeah, you know, just whatever crazy things a nine-year-old girl with three brothers does, okay? And I had so much fun back engineering that. And, and what did you do next? I understand you went to a science camp? In the 60s? Well, it, you know, it was kind of interesting. Uh, I went to a very strong high school in Connecticut, which is where I was at that time. Uh, I had a good science and math program, and one of the teachers there was an innovator and really passionate about getting science and computers and math into uh, kids, because that was pretty neglected at that in, in the mid 60s, late 60s. So two things happened. I was able to participate in some events in this, uh, it's the Talcott Mountain Science Center in Avon, Connecticut, which is still going very strong. Um, I participated in a number of things early on, and the one that comes clearly to mind, by now we'd evolved a real punch tape and a real pseudo, real computer, and programmed it to display on this, was probably amber and white, or black and white, you know, mono, monochrome monitor, uh, a martini glass filling an empty, <laughs> which was silly. Uh, but it was fun. It was encouraging the mind. It, it, it again, the logic and, and the, the, the things that, that appealed to me were there. What did you do with computers when you were in college? Well, I picked the college. Back in the late 60s, most, as far as I'm aware, most, there were not colleges that were offering computing degrees. I really wanted to go to MIT, but my dad had done his graduate degrees there and said, MIT is no place for an undergraduate, Boston's no place for a girl, don't even think about it. So I looked further afield and I ended up at McAllister in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, because they, well, they didn't have a computing degree, they had a pretty good computer lab and some pretty good math physics, and I figured that's the way I could, could get into it. So that's where I started. And I, I played tricks again. I don't know what it was. That time it was real Hollerith cards, not the toy from a decade earlier. But I programmed it to write my letters home and <laughs> do strange things like that. Uh, and uh, then I took a, a left turn in my life and was a performing musician for a decade or so and did not finish college. But the, the passion and the interest was always there. I'm talking today with Jane Gamer, who wrote programs for Big Iron back in the day when IBM 360s and 370s dominated the field. Jane, how did you first get started in computer science? Um, I went. I got a degree in computer science from the University of Iowa. Um, my roommate told me that I would come into the room once a week and say, "I know what my major is going to be now," and could never quite figure out what I wanted to do, so I, I took one of those interest tests and um, it, it put me on a scale for, for computer science up to here. <laughs> Everything else is pretty flat, but uh -huh. computer science. And so I took a class in computer science and loved it, and that became my major. What was, uh, what was your first job in the field? Um, I got a job in Ames, Iowa. Um, um, it was a direct mail company where I used, uh, it was on the IBM 3, 360, 
at that time. Mm -hmm. And they hired me because I had studied PL1 in mm -hmm. school and used it at work. And I had, I had studied assembler. Um, I started with PL1, but very quickly graduated up to um, assembler, which was a much cooler language to work with. Why is that? It was considered harder. And, uh, and so it was the cool thing to do. So show of, of brains. You like the challenge. Yes. Hi. I am here today with Jane Christopher of RCM Technologies. And Jane, can you tell us what you're doing right now? I am currently recruiting for IT professionals for permanent positions, contract, and contract for hire for a variety of clients in the metro area. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long have you been... Um, in the computer industry or associated with the computer industry? I have been in it for 33 years. How did you start out? I was an English teacher and um, needing to make more money to raise my family. And so I went to an employment agency to get ideas what a teacher could do in business. And they showed me um, what kind of money I could make in recruiting and that they would train me actually in engineering at that time. Where did you work then? What was your first job in, in computers? My first job in computers was actually in the old Fauché Tower. And um, uh, it was for a generalist firm actually called Snelling and Snelling. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I was trained in on uh, doing a variety of positions. Engineering was the focus. I did some electrical engineering, some mechanical. Um, coming from a background as an English teacher, um, which was a bit more static, uh, this was surprising to me that I enjoyed the technical because when I went to high school, there were no computers, there were no computer careers. Women went into teaching or nursing. Um, the sciences were not populated by women. Uh, and so I learned something new about myself by working in this industry is that this is really interesting <laughs> stuff. And how did you get back into computers again after that? Well, a couple of things happened. When I was doing more writing, I also had a good friend, uh, Gordon R. Dixon, a fairly well-known science fiction writer. And he'd bought a bunch of Osborns, and he was having the devil of the time. And that was one of the first times I actually sat down and started building serial cables for people, because I knew I could figure it out, and, and helped him with that, and, and did some work with that. Well, you had mentioned to me before also that you used K-Pros and uh, early Apples. At the time, I was doing a lot of writing, and... I didn't want just to use a Selectric, even though that was better than that, because you know, I'm a typo queen, mm -hmm. and yet I don't like being slowed down uh, when my thoughts and my words are flying. Mm. So I started looking at a computer, and this was back when Apple was very, very first coming out, and there was this alternate of Capro or Osborne. They were very similar products. Either one of which would have cost about two grand to get into, and that was a lot of money back then. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how I swung it. I, I, I actually chose to get the, the K Pro because the Apple was clearly more graphically focused, and the other was more Word and business application. I mean, you could, I could already see that's where it was going. So. I, I did get myself a K-Pro, um, and actually my first couple of computers were paid for with my writing, so it wasn't just a foolish, let's get a new toy. Um, a few years later, uh, I had to leave music because I'd had some severe arthritic and other orthopedic issues, and I literally, well, I couldn't even dress myself, so I certainly couldn't play music for a living anymore. And so I took some of my volunteer experience running science fiction and, and, and writers' conventions and got a job as a hotel sales manager. Okay. A year or two into that, they bought some huge, you know, computerized uh, reservation and office system and this and that, and then nobody really knew how to make it work. And, of course, throw me a puzzle, throw me a challenge. I figured it out, taught everybody how to use it, did some documentation. 
And when it was time to leave that, at some point in that, that position, I said, no, wait a minute. I'm having a whole lot more fun with this computer stuff. And uh, I went to take a position with a firm that sold um, full turnkey systems to law offices. The hardware, the software, the support for their billing and uh, document management and so on. What was, excuse me, what, what brand was that? Um, was it? Uh... It was variations. It was actually a Texas Instrument version of uh, Unix, Tenix. Uh, but we also had PCs that were running both Unix and uh, various DOS, early DOS versions. I even found one glitch that I was able to tell Microsoft they had a problem, and they actually acknowledged and fixed it. I thought that was fun. Uh, but it was, the challenge there was networks were in a total infancy. One of the skill sets that I turned out to be very good at, um, younger viewers have no clue what it was like pre-USB, mm. okay? But the reality was, if you wanted to connect any device to any computer, you needed some specialized cables. And more often than not, especially with um, printers or, or other graphic, you know, other devices, you needed, a, there's, there was not a universal serial cable. And it turned out that I was one of the only people who could sit down with a pair of manuals for the computer and its card and its output card and the device and its input and build a serial cable that worked. So a few months later, I ended up with a position with a large engineering firm. And not dissimilarly to my hotel experience, they bought hundreds of thousands of dollars of network switches and their first 25 PCs and a bunch of uh, WordPerfect boxes and and does anybody know how to plug this in? <laughs> Turn it on? Teach us how to use it? Take care of it? Oh crap, we gotta hire a new person. And we've never had a job like that before because we've never had an IT department before because we never had IT before. They hired me and over the next 10 years, I got that started, I got true networking, I got, um, I, I rolled them, I mean I taught people this is not a sewing machine foot pedal. This is a mouse. It is an input device. Or, you know, I'd have basic classes where I bet you're really afraid that if you touch the wrong button, something really awful is going to happen. So I'd be like, oh no! And then I'd have a little program that would blow up and show <laughs> stars and explosion sounds. Um, but I taught so many people, even very bright educated people but who had no skills, through, through their infancy in that, and it was a blast, and it was also the fun of getting all the stuff to work together and, and continue. What did you start out with? What, what was the system and the network interface and so forth that you started with? They had an async data switch that wasn't a true network, but had some of those capabilities. They had, what, 25 basic DOS PCs. Uh, and, and a few other things. Um, it was fun. The weekend we switched the entire company from DOS to Windows. Uh, uh -huh. uh, because by then we had several hundred users with PCs on their desks. And I was so proud of myself because we planned it, we pre-trained everybody, we worked all weekend to rebuild all the machines. We built in time for stuff to happen. And nothing did. It was really cool. And I ended up with a computer firm that actually manufactured black box type networking technologies and became a specialist in um, supporting some of the database systems and um, I kind of, I was unofficially backing up the official network people because they knew I, A, knew it and B, was cautious enough to not fat finger things. They were having the devil of a time, the official network guys, because I was a, a support specialist of a different flavor. And they bounced things off of me and they said, we just can't seem to get this guy's username working. Now this is in the day when some systems were case sensitive and some were not. Okay, so if you'd clued somebody into a system as uh, Carol 
Carol with a capital C and another system with Carol with a lowercase c, the replication of authentication across the systems just wasn't going to work. And they couldn't figure it out, and they couldn't figure it out, and they couldn't figure it out, and I said, give me a shot, hang on. So I changed it from Carol to Fred, and got it totally synced up across the whole enterprise. And then I changed it back to fr from Fred back to Carol lowercase. And it took that. But you can't change it from Carol uppercase to Carol lowercase directly. It just doesn't work. Which, which kind of a system was that? Some of the boxes were Unix. There was netware, networking. There was, um, what else was there? There were different databases, such as J.D. Edwards and, uh, and the like, where uh, the intent was to have everything replicate across the board. But you do a glitch like that, and it didn't work. So, but it was fun. Yeah. I, I moved into uh, another firm in St. Paul where I uh, went in as a temp uh, managing a due diligence uh, um, database uh, product in the legal industry. And of course, after a number of months, I was brought on as a perm, and I kind of became the special projects geek because I was no longer fully. Uh, up to speed to be a full network administrator, a Unix administrator, a, an Oracle designer, uh, this, that, or the other. But since I had my feet in every area, um, I could speak with credibility and bridge that gap. And so I became more and more of a special projects person. And literally, the running joke was, if there is a black hole, throw Carol at it. What's, I know you were working on IBM mainframes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and what that involved? We used um, this green card for assembler language. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a reference card. Um, everything you need to know shorthand is on this card. The yeah. entire language is on these two pages. Okay. Um, why, is it, why is it called a green card when it's yellow? It started out green, and oh. this is for the th IBM 370. Ah. And when they went to the the card for the 370 is actually yellow, but as far as I know, everyone just kept calling it the green card. There's quite a bit here. Um, the thing with assembler is, uh, assembler may take more instructions to get to write a report, but the instructions are short. There's more that you have to do. You have to read the data, uh, keep track of the data, put out the, the subtotals and, and, and structure the, the code. There's a lot more involved that's not done for you. You have to do it yourself. Once you've done a few of them, you know the routine and you just whip, whip, whip you get it out. And, and you do the same thing all the time. You, and you get used to it. Assembly. The other advantage that assembly has is that when it blows up, you get a core dump and you get a snapshot of everything that was in memory when it could no longer function. Mm -hmm. So you could see exactly what instruction it was on, what the problem was, and then you could reason out, kind of backtrack how you got to that point. So we didn't, we didn't at that time, the, the bigger, um, the, the purchased databases didn't exist or they were just starting. We hadn't brought them in our, into our shop yet. Um, we wrote our own database and maintained it. And um, well, was this a relational database that you wrote? Uh, could you could you run structured queries against it? Yes. Yes. Mm. Um, here's how it was used. We we used to provide data to other companies. We provide. Uh, name and address information on people to other companies. And the people in our shop, the people who actually ran these programs and provided the service for our customers, which was other companies, um, would would go into this relational database and, and we had an interactive, one interactive program um, that looked at this database and they, it, it had listed on it all the fields that you could select on. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, I want um, you know, this list of zip codes, and I want to know how many people are in each zip code, 
and who have um, a red boards. And, and so they would click on, on those fields and up would pop how many records they would get. And they would say, all right, that's enough records, that's how much the client wanted. And then they, they'd submit their, their program request to do the sequential processing, which took enough time that they would submit it to run often overnight. Um, and that program would run and, and select the records and provide and write the records out to T. Um, they would write in JCL. You could, you could decide what kind of output you wanted to write to. What's Either JCL? Job control language. And that's where you, you tell the program what program you want to write, and that program is going to have in it um, uh, prescribed input files and output files. And you tell them where the input files are and where you want the output files to go to. So if we're creating data for a, a client, then we write it out to tapes, because tapes can be wrapped up and shipped to you know another state if you want. Um, you know, and you want the reports to go to paper. Well, you told me before that some of the programs you wrote uh, back in the day were only 1 to 2K, and um, that's not even enough CPU cycles to run a splash screen in a graphical user interface program these days. So how were you able to write programs that took so little memory? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know why programs today take more memory than that. Well, you were writing like command line. It was all ASCII text, right? It wasn't. It wasn't graphics. It wasn't pixels, right? We weren't doing. We weren't doing graphics. It was sequential processing. So we were reading a record, processing the record, and writing it back out. There were times when we had to table information as we were going along. So the program itself fit within 2K. But we might be grabbing more and more memory to table up some of those records. Uh -huh. um, not always. That was kind of rare. Um, the other thing is, is that um, there were other system programs that would be running at the same time as my program to support it. So the, the input-output, some of the routines that handled the processing of the tape, there was a lot going on in the background so that when I said get a, get a record, there was a program running in the background that was reading a few blocks of records ahead of time and then handing over a record one at a time and it was so it was just there when I needed it and the same thing with writing I'd, I'd say write a record and then go on and process and my program's running and running but in the background this this support um, programming is gathering up these records into blocks and then sending them out to the tape or the desk um, okay. So that was going on. There was system programming. So when I said get more memory, it was it was looking around saying, okay, no one's using this. You can have it. And so I'd say get some memory and instantaneously, you know, get an address back saying it starts here and you've got this many bytes. Um, things like that were going on. Uh, things so that there were always other people's programming programs running at the same time as ours. Plus all the people who were on on the interactive programs. Um, so there had to be something running in the background that um, made sure that we weren't interfering with each other. Mm. <laughs> um, the, the data would come in and we would either read it from a tape or a series of tapes or we would use um, the disk files um, which were um, packages, big plastic boxes about this tall and that wide, maybe wider. Mm -hmm. And inside of it were um, several disc platters. Uh -huh. They never moved. We did not pick up those platters and store them someplace. They stayed in that box permanently. Uh -huh. The data was written to it and erased. Or in some cases, depending on, on what we needed, um, some, some discs would always have our um, permanent data on there. I know that um these days, a modern um, database program, like say Oracle or something, a relational database, um, those programs put data in structured tables and then ret retrieve entire sets of records at once. Now, how did the programs that you use with the mainframes differ from that model? Most of them processed data sequentially, 
read, they would read one record, process the record, gather up whatever information. So if we wanted to do a report of how many people lived in each zip code, then we would read the record, tally up, you know, here's one more record for zip code 55101, mm -hmm. and move on. Um, we did have one database, one or two databases, in our shop, um, in my first job. That was a database that we wrote ourselves, that we designed and wrote and maintained ourselves. So it had the indexes, much like the Oracle does. Um, it did much the same thing as, as, as the modern day databases. So what are the changes that you've seen? Well, I know back when you started, it would have been big iron. It would have been mainframes, right? Right. So what kind of skills did programmers need back then? Well, I was working in engineering, and that was the C Unix world and assembly, those kinds of things. The mainframe world was more main, uh, COBOL, uh, BAL, assembler, and um, uh, gradually, with the advent of the client server, environment, C and Unix moved over into that area, and, and I was strong in that, so um, I actually ended up working more software engineers um, at some of our large manufacturers, uh, but in addition, also working within some of our other clients, finding C Unix developers. Now, if it was 33 years ago, that would have been, what, in the 80s? 1981. Um, 81, yeah. That was just the very, very beginning of the personal computer era. Mm -hmm. um, and what, um, how long did it take before the main, the main thrust of, of computing was for PC and networks versus mainframes and, and minis and so on? I can't remember the exact year, but at one point I was with another company and uh, they were looking at PCs, and at that time, the two choices seemed to be IBM or Stern's computer, uh, and they were based in St. Louis Park. Um, Stern's had some better options where multiple users could get on at the same time, and IBM's at that point did not allow that um, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, but um, they went with IBM because they figured they would be around, and that has played out, of course. So, um, what what innovations did you see that that really you know changed the changed the game? Really shook things up. Well, um, uh, another company I worked for after that, we actually had uh, desktops, and it was DOS. And on DOS, I could see all of the information I needed on one screen. And when we went to Windows, I did so kicking and screaming because I needed to do 20 clicks to get the same information. And I didn't totally value it at that time. Um, the search capabilities in the early days were limited. And uh, I know at, at this one company, we had a big old box in a closet almost, an NCR machine. And that's where our, our uh, searches would be, and they would spit out paper at us. And um, we'd take them back to our desk. Well, what did you see? OK, after, the, after you started getting into the PC era, what were the skills that employers wanted at that point? Well, there was a lot of Unix at first, and um, databases being Oracle was, mm. was pretty massive. Um, but C, C, Perl, lots of the Unix scripting, shell scripting, um, and, you know, Windows. Microsoft's impact was great mm. in changing all of that, and then we went into the uh, C++, C Sharp, um, SQL Server databases, and uh, Windows, all kinds of Windows. <laughs>
Um, by then I had married, had my first child, uh, when they realized at this particular position that they weren't going to have me working 70 hours a week and traveling all the time because I now had an infant, uh, they let me go the day I was to come back from my maternity leave. So a few months later I ended up with a position with a large engineering firm. They brought me on board, uh, although it was interesting. Um, I went through several phone interviews, but the final in-person interview, there were 12 or 14 people around the table. And these are, these are bright people. They, you know, many of them have multiple PhDs, they've got this, they got that. Um, they aren't necessarily the warmest on people skills, and there was concern among management how this new role would work with the nature of the staff. So they, I was told later that the purpose of the interview was to intentionally try to intimidate me. But I didn't want that happened. Um, after 10 years there, it was clear there was a very blatant glass ceiling and some other things. So I, I took a hike. I actually got the first time I've actually quit a job instead of been laid off because of a company purchase or something. And uh, I did it even without a job in hand, but within less than a week I had seven offers in my lap. So I was doing okay. Okay. Um, how did the makeup of the department change as time went on? Did the, did the newer employees um, have different backgrounds than the, the uh, older people or the original employees? Do you know? There was a mix of computer science majors and other majors. One of, one of the people I work, worked with had um, a background in music. And there is a correlation between music and, and logic or programming. Um, one of the guys I worked with taught math and then got out of that and went into programming. Got, we grew, um, the department grew, and the number of women increased, the percentage of women increased as time went on. Um, I did not feel any discrimination based on being a woman. So, tell me some of the more interesting stories from your career. Well, I remember uh, the time period when IT was booming, and uh, besides doing engineering, I was doing a lot of COBOL mainframe work, and our, we found candidates, uh, not from searching databases, but by advertising in the newspaper, and they did not apply by a fax. They had to mail them uh, or make a phone call, and uh, and then we would meet with them. So it was it was a lengthy process. But companies were buying. They needed IT people desperately, and um, uh, that went on for several years. Um, and, and when there were shortages, um, the the advent of more. Uh, Consultants from other nations came into play and um, couldn't get enough of those either. So uh, when a recession did hit, um, I think after Y2K there was a big one, a big drop, and IT people could not get jobs, and I was shocked. And some left the field, some hung in there doing other jobs until they could get back in. And uh, uh, so much new happening every day that no one person can ever keep up with it all. Sure. And, and that's a challenge. And, and so, you know, for people to succeed in, in the computer world, they have to have a passion for it and be driven um, to continue learning. It, it's a huge challenge for them. And for me on the staffing side, it's a huge challenge because I have to say, tell me about that. This is new. <laughs> no, I don't know. But uh, that's, that's one of the things about the industry that I love is is that it does change. It, it is challenging. What sort of experiences did your did your female IT applicants have? You know, during the earlier period of of did did you find that it was harder to place them? Uh, I don't know if it was harder to place them, but it was harder to get them to look. Mm. If they had a position, they were risk adverse. And um, especially if it was consulting, uh, if it was a permanent spot they needed, you know, and, and they were actively seeking it, uh, well, that would work. But if, if they were contacted to consider a new idea, a new position, they would be less likely to move forward. So, um, 
What are you seeing these days in terms of what do employers want today? They want everything. <laughs> um, they have a very long skill list, plus um, they want excellent communications and presentation. Um, they want people that do have a passion for what they're doing. We get specifically asked for you know people who uh, have that kind of personality and background. Well, how hard is it to give companies candidates that have everything? I was looking at one of our boards. They supply information on different areas on the number of openings versus the number of available people, it's skewed tremendously towards openings versus people available, tremendously, more, more than you would even think. I, I won't throw a number out because I can't be exact, but it, it's from like two digits on up to five. <laughs>
just been purchased by another company. Mm. And the, per the first order of business was to get rid of Y2K. I've heard people talk about what a crock Y2K was, all the concern about Y2K. See, we didn't blow up. What was the big deal? Well, the reason we didn't blow up is because companies took the threat very seriously. Their companies has to work, have to work. Their, their programs have to work. They can't be blowing up. <laughs> And so, in 1999, um, programmers were hard at work going through every single program in the shop, making sure they caught every program that was run in the shop, looked at every incidence of a date being written as nine, you know, the last two digits and changing it to the last, to, to four digits. That was my first year at that company. When I came into programming, we didn't really have to worry about it that much. So when, when I started working, there were programs already in existence that used the two-byte year, and that was the way it was done. And we handled, when we had to handle the turn of the century, it was going from the 1800s to the 1900s. We were dealing with birth dates. And I was working in the um, 80s when some people had still been born in the late 1800s. And so we had to deal with that, but we just did.